Hey everyone, today we dive into one of the most intense conflicts in early American history, the Pequot War, fought between 1636 and 1638. Imagine this, you've got English settlers arriving in New England in the early 1600s, setting up their new lives, and then a brutal clash erupts between them and a powerful Native American tribe, the Pequot. So, what kicked off this war? It all started when two English traders, Captain John Stone and John Oldham, were killed, allegedly by members of the Western Niantic tribe, allies of the Pequot. This wasn't just any isolated incident though, it became the spark that lit the fuse. In response, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, led by Governor Sir Henry Vane at the time, wasn't going to let it slide. They sent John Endicott on a mission to Block Island, where Oldham had been killed, demanding the Niantic hand over the culprits. Instead of negotiating, Endicott and his crew ended up torching villages and killing people there. They didn't stop with just Block Island, they went on to attack a Pequot village, burning it down and destroying their crops. As you can imagine, this made the situation way worse. The Pequots, understandably furious, retaliated by raiding English settlements, killing colonists in return. Things escalated quickly from there. On May 26, 1637, a group of militia from Massachusetts and Connecticut colonies teamed up with some Native American allies, the Narragansett and Mohegan tribes, to launch a major attack on the Pequot stronghold at Mystic. What happened next was horrific. They set the fort on fire, and more than 700 Pequot people, mostly women and children, were killed in the flames or slaughtered as they tried to escape. The remaining Pequots, including their chief Sasakis, fled, trying to find safety with the Iroquois Confederacy. But even that didn't go as planned. The Mohawks, part of the Iroquois, ended up executing Sasakis and sent his head back to the English. By the time the war was over, the Pequot tribe was practically wiped out. Out of around 3,000 people, only a little over 200 survived. And it didn't end there, many of the survivors were sold into slavery, either in the West Indies, Bermuda, or handed over to local tribes like the Mohegans and Narragansetts. The survivors were also forbidden from even calling themselves Pequot or returning to their homeland. The aftermath of the Pequot War was devastating. The Pequot tribe was nearly exterminated, and this opened up Connecticut and Long Island for further English expansion, paving the way for more settlements. But here's the kicker. Modern historians generally believe that the Pequots weren't really to blame for the war. Many think the English settlers fabricated reasons to justify the conflict because they wanted more land and better access to trade routes. Now, before the English even showed up, the Pequot were a dominant force in the region. They lived along the coast of present-day Connecticut and Long Island Sound for thousands of years, and when the Dutch arrived in 1614, the Pequot were already powerful. At first, they worked with the Dutch, but things went sour pretty fast. The Pequot, who were flexing their muscle over smaller tribes, had forbidden them from trading directly with the Dutch. When the Massabesic tribe tried to trade anyway, the Pequot didn't take kindly to it. They killed several of them on the way to the Dutch trading post. The Dutch, not willing to back down, captured the Pequot chief, Tatabem, and held him for ransom. Now the Dutch were expecting a hefty ransom, likely in fur, but instead, the Pequot sent highly polished shells, known as wampum, which was a prized item among the Native Americans. Thinking the Pequot were mocking them, the Dutch killed Tatabem and returned his body to the tribe. Of course, the Pequot weren't about to let that slide, they burned down the Dutch trading post. Realizing they needed to make amends or risk losing trade, the Dutch quickly replaced the head of the trading post with a guy named Peter Bernsen, who could speak the local Algonquin language. Through negotiations, he figured out that wampum wasn't just some random shells, it was highly valued, even used as currency among native tribes. So, the Dutch and the Pequot worked out a deal, and the Pequot gained a monopoly on the fur trade with the Dutch by having their allied tribes produce wampum in bulk. In return, the Dutch provided them with valuable goods like iron pots, tools, and weapons. 
And just when you think things might settle, in 1620, the English arrive at Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. They quickly found success thanks to the help of the local native tribes, which encouraged even more English immigrants to arrive in the following years. By 1600, the English had started to expand aggressively under John Winthrop, and tensions began to build not only with the Pequot but also with the Dutch as both sides competed for control over trade and territory. As English settlers began trading directly with some of the Pequot's tributary tribes, tensions really started to escalate. These tribes, like the Mohegans, saw an opportunity to bypass the Pequot and trade directly with the English, who offered them better deals. This shift drove a wedge between the Pequot and their allies. The Mohegans in particular, felt disrespected by the Pequot and broke away, siding with the English, who they believed treated them more fairly. With this alliance, the Mohegans essentially helped shift control of wampum production and trade away from the Pequot. At this point, the English had no real regard for either the natives or the Dutch. They were focused on expanding their own control. They saw themselves as the rightful claimants to New England, with one English document from 1637 even boasting that New England was named after the English because they discovered it. The Dutch, who had been there earlier, were seen as an obstacle, expected to stick to their own territories further south in what they called New Netherlands. Tensions with the Dutch also played a part in igniting this war. In 1634, Captain John Stone and seven of his crew were killed, allegedly by the Niantic tribe. When confronted by the English, the Niantics claimed they thought Stone was Dutch and acted out of revenge for the killing of one of their own. In an attempt to keep peace, Pequot leader Sassacus sent the English some wampum as compensation. But in 1636, things flared up again when another English trader, John Oldham, was killed, supposedly by the Neontics, though many believe it was actually the Narragansetts who were responsible. Despite these complexities, both incidents were used by the English as an excuse to move against the Pequot, whose land and control over trade were valuable to them. It's worth mentioning that both Stone and Oldham weren't exactly saints. Stone was a pirate and a slaver, so when word spread of his death, most of the colonists didn't shed any tears. Oldham, on the other hand, had been banished from Plymouth Colony and had a reputation for causing trouble. But still, their deaths provided Massachusetts Bay Colony with the justification it needed to push the Pequot off their lands. Sir Henry Vane, who was the governor of Massachusetts Bay at the time, sent John Endicott to Block Island to demand the Neontics hand over Oldham's murderers. Initially, the Neontics thought they were dealing with traitors, but Endicott's force was heavily armed, and things quickly took a violent turn. When the Neontics refused his demands, including wampum, hostages, and the surrender of the killers, Endicott launched an attack, burning villages and leaving destruction in his wake. Then he did the same to a nearby Pequot village. This violence hadn't been officially authorized, and Vane wasn't thrilled about it, knowing it would provoke a fierce retaliation. And sure enough, it did. From the fall of the 636 through the spring of the 637, the Pequot launched raids on English settlements, killing colonists, burning homes, and disappearing into the wilderness before the English could respond. The English, now led once again by Governor John Winthrop after he replaced Vane, were on the defensive but found it difficult to counter these guerrilla-style attacks. Winthrop reached out to William Bradford, the governor of Plymouth Colony for help, and Bradford agreed to support him. Meanwhile, the Pequot were trying to rally the Narragansetts to their side, arguing that the English would eventually turn on them too. If the Narragansett allied with the Pequot, they could launch a coordinated attack on the colonists and potentially drive them out. This plan might have worked, but Roger Williams, who had been exiled from Massachusetts Bay Colony and had close ties with the Narragansett, convinced them otherwise. Williams argued that the Narragansett would be better off siding with the English, who could help them wipe out their old rivals, the Pequot, and open up Pequot lands for trade. Trusting Williams, the Narragansett chiefs, Canonicus and Myantanomo, chose to align with the English. 
This decision by the Narragansett was a game changer. Had they sided with the Pequot, history might have played out very differently. Instead, they helped guide the English militia, led by John Underhill of Massachusetts Bay and John Mason of Connecticut, to the Pequot stronghold at Mystic, Connecticut. On May 26, 1637, just before dawn, the English and their native allies launched their attack. They broke through the front gate of the Pequot fort, set it on fire, and shot anyone trying to escape. Since most of the Pequot warriors were away, the massacre primarily claimed the lives of over 700 people, mostly women and children, who were trapped in the flames or killed as they fled. This attack, which became known as the Mystic Massacre, was hailed by the English as a great victory. John Winthrop even declared a public day of thanksgiving in celebration after the militia returned home. But the reality of what had happened was far from heroic. It was a brutal slaughter of innocents. While the English suffered only minor casualties, the impact on the Pequot was devastating, leaving their population shattered. And after the horrific events at Mystic, the few surviving Pequots who managed to escape quickly spread the word to the other Pequot fort. They retaliated by ambushing the English militia on their march back home, but their numbers were too few to put up a real fight. Sassacus, the Pequot leader, realized they couldn't hold out much longer and led his people south, hoping to find refuge and support from the Mohawks near what we now call Manhattan. But the English weren't letting up. John Mason, along with his Mohegan ally, Uncas, chased them down relentlessly. By mid-June 1637, they caught up with Sassacus and his group near a swamp in modern-day Fairfield, Connecticut. The English and their allies allowed the surrender of the Pequot women and children, but Sassacus and some of his warriors managed to slip away. Unfortunately for Sassacus, things didn't get any better when he reached the Mohawks. Instead of offering help, the Mohawks executed him almost immediately and sent his head and hands to the English as a sign of friendship. With their leader gone, Sassacus' followers scattered. Some returned to their homes, while others stayed in the region, blending into other tribes. By 1638, the war officially ended with the signing of the Treaty of Hartford. The remaining 200 Pequots were either sold into slavery in the West Indies and Bermuda or handed over to local colonists. Many of them were given as slaves to the Mohegan and Narragansett, but the treatment they received, especially from the Mohegan, was so brutal that even the colonists stepped in to reclaim some of them out of sheer pity. The Pequot were forbidden from returning to their homeland or even calling themselves Pequot, and their territory was divided among the victors, with the English taking control of the most valuable riverfront land. Now, some of the Pequots who were reclaimed by the colonists would later become known as the Mashantucket Pequots. In 1651, they were given land at Noink, but just 15 years later, in 1666, they were relocated to Mashantucket. By the late 1700s, their numbers had dwindled significantly, by 1774, only 151 Pequots remained on the reservation, and by 1800, there were less than 40 left. Many of those who had converted to Christianity joined the Brotherton movement and left to live with that community. Meanwhile, the demands for land by American settlers steadily shrank the Mashantucket Reservation from 1,000 acres to just 213 by 1856. It wasn't until the 1970s that the Pequot descendants began to fight back in the courts, seeking justice for the illegal land sales of the 19th century. By 1983, after years of struggle, they won their case, and the Mashantucket Reservation was restored to 1,250 acres. They also gained official recognition from the U.S. government, along with federal aid, which they invested wisely. With the profits they established Foxwoods Resort, which at one point became the largest casino in the United States. The success of Foxwoods drew many Pequot descendants back to their ancestral lands, allowing the tribe to start reviving their language and culture. Looking back, most modern scholars agree that the Pequot War wasn't about justice or self-defense on the part of the English, 
It was a calculated move to expand their influence and push out the Dutch from the lucrative trade in the region. Historian John Wilson puts it bluntly, stating that the so-called Pequot offenses, which had either happened years before or weren't even committed by Pequots, were nothing more than a pretext for the English to seize land and monopolize the fur and wampum trade. The prediction made by the Pequots to the Narragansett, that the English would eventually turn on them too, came true just 40 years later during King Philip's War. Metacomet, also known as King Philip, had united several tribes to resist English expansion, but the Narragansetts had tried to remain neutral. However, when they took in native refugees from the conflict, the English accused them of aiding the enemy. Just as they had done to the Pequot, the colonists attacked the Narragansett, burning their fort and killing women and children in a brutal repeat of the Mystic Massacre. The Narragansett did fight back, but by that point, it was too late. By now, the English settlers had grown in numbers and power, and they continued to take land from the indigenous tribes, eventually spreading their control from the east coast all the way to the west. The Pequot War set the stage for how the English colonists would deal with Native Americans from that point onward. After 1637 the heaven was clear, expand their territory, subdue or eliminate the native population, and claim the land as their own. Today, the phrase, land of the free and the home of the brave is celebrated, but it often overlooks the people who were displaced and the violent history behind that expansion, something that still resonates with many to this day.